Hi everyone, my name is James Feeney. Welcome to or back to my channel. Today I want to speak to the effects of modern society and all that that encompasses on magic and spirituality. I want to take an approach uh, that's a little bit more critical, I would say, and that's really where the conception of this idea started. I know this is a very big topic, one that's also been spoken about quite a bit in a variety of different ways. I'm hoping I can offer something new to the dialogue. I would like this to be helpful in some way, so I do think that thinking critically about these things and understanding what drawbacks and positive aspects we may gain from the world around us are, it can only help us in our practice in creating and crafting magic, having a more mindful spiritual practice, that's really how I approach anything like this. I will say that, like I said, the conception of this idea started from a more critical space, so I am going to be speaking a bit more... I don't want to even make it sound negative, but I am going to parse and pick apart a lot of modern trends and things that I see going on and the effects that I find them to have on my personal spiritual practice and magical practice. That, again, is a very broad topic. Spirituality to you can mean something completely different. It may be a more religious way of viewing the world. It may be something that's more free and open and, fl open and fluid. It may be more of a lifestyle. Nonetheless, I'm hoping that there's still something to be gained, or at least that we can start a dialogue and have some critical thinking going on where we're asking questions that are hopefully going to benefit us in the long run. Preface aside, I do have some points that I'm going to cover. I'm going to start with the more critical aspects, and then at the end, we will end with a few more positive notes and things that I've seen that I personally think have enhanced my practice that I found in more modern trends and in modern society. I am grappling with a bit of a cold, so I have some congestion and a nasally voice going on, so apologies for that. But without further ado, we'll jump right in. Really what I want to speak to is and are trends that I see in society that have been happening for quite some time that have had lasting effects, and of course these effects are on our lives at large, not necessarily just magic and spirituality, but we don't function in a vacuum, our compartments are not sealed, a lot of the areas of our life bleed into each other, and so I really want to speak to that. And if I'm speaking more I'm going to use the word critical quite a bit in this video. If I'm speaking more critically about youth or young trends or younger culture, I'm also then speaking to myself as somebody who is on the cusp of being a uh, millennial or Gen Z. So any of those critical remarks, I factor myself in. I am inclusive of myself and am equally evaluating and picking apart anything that I may be participating in. So I have some notes, so I'm going to be referencing those. Uh, societal developments and things that, okay, so of course we have a big one that I've noticed and something that's important I think to account for that I've seen a lot lately and just thought about in terms of history are the, I would say, the things that we value, our core values, societal core values, which are going to change depending on where you're located in the world. Of course, this is a more Western view or lens, and I'm in the US, so I'm going to be speaking to things like capitalism as well, but these may not apply to all cultures and all areas of the world, but I do think that as a whole, as a collective, there has been a big shift in values over the course of many years. Things like importance placed on aesthetics and materiality, which we can speak to in so many different ways, there's even a lot of counterculture, I guess, movements going on. You could argue that that's where the idea of a lot of these depthier trends have come from and, and trying to fight back against that or at least to function more mindfully in spite of this type of trend or societal condition. I do think that that affects magical and spiritual practices. We see this all the time with the idea that we need to accumulate items. We have really intelligent corporations and... I guess you could even say algorithms and technology that really cater to and try to keep us, you could, I guess, classify it addicted to these materials, making us think that we need them, making us think that we'll be better with them. And so it turns into somebody having many materials that they not they may not necessarily know how to use or may not be using completely or that may not be fulfilling them within one's magical practice. So we have 
things like clutter, we have things like useless tools or tools that we don't necessarily know how to use or we aren't using in a conscious way when you have so much of any given thing it's hard to really get to know it or hard to actually build a relationship or rapport or a skill set with that one item when you have for example an altar altar full or a room full of crystals and bobs and bits it, it tends to become there's a visual clutter aspect and we might even think that for example things like minimalism are trying to combat that but by and large, I would say trends in terms of values and the value placed on money, aesthetics, items, materiality, status, and social class, which that's not necessarily new, but I guess the way that it's specific to the modern society is very interesting in that there's this idea of perception that plays in and one not necessarily knowing where anybody sits in terms of class, society, and resources. Uh, there's privileges in all of this, of course, in terms of race, ethnicity, beliefs, uh, where you live, your socioeconomic status, all of that is going to play into the way that this, I guess, modern value system then impacts your practice. And these are things that are pretty new. I would say I spoke to the collective or the global society. That's something that wasn't really a thing. If we go back even just a few decades or, of course, a, hundred, a couple hundred years, not really having access to all these areas of the world. We didn't really have to contend with, I would say, other cultures, other societies, other groups outside of one's own. We didn't have to necessarily, uh, I guess, integrate or fight for or vie for a spot within a larger group, per se. Uh, so that being what it is, I do see that in some ways as a detriment. Like I said, at the end, I'm going to get to some positives. The biggest impacts that I've seen on this mostly has to do with influence and comparison, which are, there are many great videos out there speaking to both, but I do think that when we aren't necessarily viewing our practice as our own, or at least we may think that we are, but in actuality we've done a lot of work in comparing and purchasing and being influenced by others around us, and it's not necessarily a negative thing, but it can make it difficult to understand where you start and others end. And in a spiritual practice where we want to self-identify, in a magical practice where we want to better serve ourselves and potentially serve others, it's important to have, I think in my opinion, a strong sense of self. And in a global society where values of interconnectedness and values that may tilt the scales towards less human-driven interactions, it can be difficult, I think, to maintain a savory, fulfilling, spiritual or magical practice. So I just like to be mindful of those things and journal, look at my items, decide after a period of time if I'm using them, why I'm using them. Did I purchase this thing because I saw somebody else buy it? Is there a value to it for me? What should I, what do I actually need and what do I want to gain from this? So setting clear goals about I would say more intrinsic ideas, things that I want to get out of my practice, like feelings of satisfaction and happiness and peace are important. And then taking, for example, the material aspects or my relationships with the outside world and factoring in if those feed that sort of goal, that intrinsic, that abstract concept that exists outside of a very mundane and material sense. And so that's the way that I tend to try to counterbalance or mitigate the damages that may come from what seems to be, for me, a warped value system on a global scale, and that's something that deserves a video of its own. There are many topics in here that I'm going to speak to that I think could I could just speak entirely to, but I just wanted to touch upon these. I was actually speaking to Manuela from Place of Stillness, having a nice chat, having a coffee together, and we both spoke to, I was sharing my ideas for this video, and she had wonderful things to say. Would def definitely recommend checking out her channel. I'll link it down below. One of the things that she mentioned and we spoke to in our chat was about sharing things uh, and the lessened degree of privacy, which, again, another topic that's been spoken to endlessly, and there's a lot out there already on that. But it's something I think of value to consider in your own spiritual or magical practice, what you're sharing and why. And I would say, what does that mean for you? Like I said, where does one end and the group begin? And having those defined values that can be helpful for that sense of self and mindful practice. So 
I, of course, we all tend to share things, especially if you're on YouTube and I share things about my practice in life and this was something for me to then consider. Am I doing something that's more performative? Am I engaging in a ritual just to be able to post about it or to do something spiritual and just to be able to speak about it and that experience or am I doing it for myself? And if I am, is sharing it then a breach of, I guess, boundaries with myself and what I'm hoping to then gain. This is going to be fluid and it's a big gray zone. It's going to be different for everyone, but I do think it's important to consider and maybe flesh out where your boundaries lie in terms of privacy and sharing with others. If you are somebody who does share on social media or with others in, in a more internet global, like I said, global society where a lot of things are out there, where our privacy is encroached on every day, where do we want to find those bits of or little snippets, I should say, of things that we keep just for ourselves. And is that an important thing for you or is that not so important? Uh, I do personally find it to be a bit of a detriment, especially when you, or I personally have fallen into the trap for spans of time where I feel compelled to share things, where there's this sort of, I wouldn't even say not, not just the element of compulsion, but like a guilt if I do something, but don't make more of it. And again, that feeds, I guess, into that more capitalistic warped value system where you feel like you have to get or really milk a thing for everything it's worth. So the practice may be worth something very personal to me, but then I think to myself, I can get more out of this or it can be worth more, or is it more productive to then use what I'm doing there that's also serving me to serve, for example, my channel or my business. And then I need to, I guess, dabble in where my boundaries are, are set and maybe reevaluate them and, and go back to the drawing board. But I do think privacy and intentions are, are, are interesting. There's also the idea that you can't be sure of what you're seeing and its validity or how real any given thing is. With technology, we can edit and make something look extremely aesthetically pleasing. It may look as though somebody's doing something when in actuality, actuality they aren't. They may look make something look one way when it's really the other. We condense things. So somebody's five minute ritual, if you go to then take inspiration from it, may take you an hour. And maybe it took them many, many hours and they're relighting the same candle multiple times. So we can't be sure exactly what's real. And even when it is seemingly real and the creator may attest to the, the reality to the rawness of what they're sharing, there is an element of filming. There is obviously going to be an element of editing and just fiddling around with the aesthetics and the idea of posting it. So even if it's unintentional, the idea that things that we may be seeing and thinking are are great for inspiration or things that we should aspire to, them not, of course, being entirely real or attainable. Uh, not even attainable to the person who, for example, created them in the first place. So there's that to, to then consider as well. Another thing that I wanted to touch on, and this was actually one of the bigger inspirations for this video, one that I find extremely important, and again, another one that I would love to just make an entire video on, but shorter attention spans that are constantly encouraged and perpetuated, they detract from our focus and the time needed to truly engage, engage in a meaningful spiritual practice. Uh, for me, the reason that I even began to think about this, well, it's been something I think about consistently, but TikTok, for example, you may think or you may know of TikTok. For me, it's a relatively new, dis not discovery, but the way that I've started to actually watch it. And of course, there are geniuses behind this. There are algorithms that want us to become reliant on, that want us to become addicted to, these short snippets that make them entertaining. And I think the human attention span and focus, we are kind of drawn to things that move, that are flashy, that are short, that really are punchy and catch us. And over time, those have decreased in their amount of time. They've needed to become more and more visually stimulating, more auditorily stimulating to us in order to grab us. And that has become more difficult. And now we're down to these segments that are under a minute or only a few seconds that we're supposed to continually scroll through that we then get hooked on. I personally always thought that YouTube was even for shorter, I guess, a shorter attention span type of entertainment or content consu uh, consumption. 
but it's becoming increasingly shorter. And I even found after, for example, scrolling through TikTok for a bit, which of course is addicting and you lose yourself in it, but then I go to watch even a YouTube video and my mind, the way it's operating, is getting either bored or unfocused by the YouTube video. It wants to seek out a secondary source of entertainment or content consumption. I'm becoming less engaged with videos that are longer, and I really don't like that. I, I find that that's something I want to avoid. I want to think critically and be able to listen to things for long spans of time and I'll pick up a book to read and I start to get bored or I have the desire to then put it down to seek out something that's more immediately gratifying, that is more stimulating in whatever way that might look in the world around us. But uh, that is one thing, of course, that's concerning just as a lifestyle or the human condition at large that's concerning. But in more spiritual and magical practice, I think the idea of, for example, meditation and focus to be able to cast a spell, we really need to have this directed, honed, single-mindedness on an intention. I do believe that magic is essentially exuding one's willpower out onto the world, for lack of a better term, or inciting change in some way through conscious uh, intention and willpower, something to that effect. That's how I would define magic. But when we can't maintain focus when we are when our minds are jumping from one thing to the next and we find that we can't necessarily allocate our attention to one thought to one practice for more than a few minutes how well are the outcomes going to turn out is the spell going to be uh, is there going to be some sort of efficacy problem with the the spell crafting that one might be engaging in or the internal meditation meditative process or work that one might be doing with a higher power or deity? Is there a disruption? Is there an impediment? Now that your or our, my attention span is so much shorter than maybe what it previously was, or that I find it very difficult to engage with anything that takes more than a few minutes of my time or thought that it requires my entire focus. To me, that's very concerning. Um, of course, I think in modern society, then, there are substitutes and different ways of engaging in spirituality and magic that do probably benefit from shorter attention spans, things that we can then uh, multitask and jump from one thing to the other. But ultimately, I don't think there's a modern substitute for good old fashioned focus, attention and time that can be spent on on a practice, on a thought, on a spell, on any given thing. Uh, and so to me, I want to reclaim my attention span and extend it. I want to reclaim my ability to be able to think about one given thing or to do any task without having to think or reach for another thing. Uh, to me, that's really, really important and it's something that I'm finding harder to do for myself. I notice that seems to be the case for most other people out there that I've talked to and just based in observation. So there's that as well. Uh, there was another point I wanted to make that was Oh, in, in this sort of, I guess, shorter attention span where we're seeking distractions, uh, something that I dislike and find is really difficult is the idea that we can't spend time with ourselves. I've spoken to this before and many have, but we're constantly seeking distractions. There's so much media, there's so many types, again, objects when we think of that warped value system where we are constantly needing to be engaged, constantly needing to be touching something, thinking about something, what's next? What's next after I do this? I'm not focusing on what I'm doing because I have three other things I know I have to do after. To me, this is actually a very modern concept in the grand scheme of things, going back maybe 200 years where we have farmers or rural societies or societies where you had one role, this was your job, maybe you had to attend to your family as well, but when you were doing any given task, that's what you were doing. And there was this sort of, I guess, heightened element of proficiency and skill and mastery over any given thing because of the amount of attention it needed and the amount of time one would spend with it. And when doing these things, one was spending time with themselves. I even think I have a theory that the idea of shadow work is something that couldn't or wouldn't have been even relevant to generations past, at least not in the same way that it is to the most recent, I guess, maybe like five or six generations. Thinking, for example, somebody who, going back 
generations was maybe a seamstress or a farmer, you're with yourself. You're constantly having to process, to integrate, to contend with your thoughts. You don't necessarily get to escape them. The things that we then feel like we have to take time to confront in shadow work, things that we aren't consciously aware of, good or bad, are things that we may not have ever needed to confront if we weren't constantly distracting ourselves from from our thoughts, from our experiences with ourselves. The farmer who is tilling the field in 1800, they uh, very well had probably a very good understanding of themselves, of any given thing going on in their life, because they had no, all that time to just process and keep doing things uh, to really sift through who they were, if that makes sense. Now, today, I'm on my phone, I'm in a book, I'd have all these obligations, I have friends, I need to drive here, go there, attend to this, and before I know it, the maybe the interesting dynamic that I had earlier in the day, had I had no time to mentally process that, and in fact, my unconscious mind is working on processing that. Maybe I was offended, maybe I felt like I misspoke, and my conscious mind doesn't necessarily get the time to really flesh it through, to create a bridge with that unconscious processing, and so now I'm three steps ahead, and I have three very different processes going on unconsciously that are creating, I guess, or contributing, perpetuating a shadow good or bad, and so the, the fast-paced nature, the nature, I would say, of the way that we need to operate, and it not being conducive to having a sense of self, or checking in with the self, taking time with the self, we are constantly and increasingly becoming more detached from ourselves in a way that creates, to me, a sort of dissonance, where shadow work is, of course, now very important. I'm not saying it would have been obsolete or irrelevant in in hundreds of years prior, but I don't think it would have needed the same sort of attention and conscious effort put into it in the way that I think it does today. So to me, the idea of shadow work is actually a byproduct of, well, the shadow work that we come to know and use is a byproduct of a lot of these modern trends and the way that we operate as, as modern individuals in 2021. So there's that. Another thing that I wanted to speak to, and this again is one that has been spoken about for decades at this point, but the idea of human interaction and those interactions changing in some way. Uh, you might, some say that it that there's less human interaction. I would argue that that's not necessarily the case, but the shift in the way that we interact can pose a detriment or obstacle or something to that effect. I think that the physical human one-on-one -on -one or in-person interactions that we've that we have are important. They're not necessarily replaceable just because we have, for example, an online community or people that we can seek out that have those like-minded ideas that we might not have in real life. I don't think there's a true replacement for intimate, in-person, one-on-one, direct human communication. I think that the way that our minds have to process and shift to communicate in that less attached way where we aren't necessarily facing somebody or they aren't in the room with us or we can escape them. We have things like trolls and bullies and people feeling like they can then have one personality here and another there or not feeling like they can and there's nothing wrong with that but that they can say something that they definitely would not say in person online and not be held accountable for it in the same way or that the friendship that you build that you may have that's very close you don't necessarily get to reach the point where you get to see the person and interact with them in a way that I think our mind desires, or at least to some degree wishes it had with a person that we can then connect with. There's a lot to unpack there, and when we get to the positive aspects, I do think that there are a lot of positives that come with this less attached or, I would say, more network widespread type of communicating communicating uh, but i do think there are, are drawbacks and detriments and really the reason that i wanted to even speak to any of these little notes that i jotted down was to get us thinking critically about them i think the more that i think about them engage with them and try to understand how they are affecting myself the better and more mindful my practice is is overall my life is I'm making very conscientious decisions based on what I want to do and anticipating the consequences, both good and bad, negative and positive. Uh, when I, for example, 
scroll on on an app or when I am engaging in my practice and I find myself distracted. I like to know the why, the understanding or the inner working of why I'm doing what I'm doing. What is the purpose? If it's not serving one, how do we then maybe kind of oust it or mitigate that or, you know, work on it if it's a bad habit or something like that. So getting into a few positive aspects and the positives will actually mirror a lot of the negatives because most of these qualities and most of the things that I spoke about as negatives or that are a little bit more critical also have a positive side to them. So there's that as well. And I do think it's important to be appreciative of what we have to understand that there's so much that we have at our disposal these days that we can use to our benefit. Of course, to think critically and not allow the downsides or the negative aspects to dominate our lives, but to also capitalize capitalize is such a capitalistic word and very reflective of society at large, but to capitalize on the positive aspects that do come with any of these these trends, these technologies, these values, all of that, all of the above. Um, going back to the idea of that warped value system that we do have to function within or contend with in our societies, there's of course the positives in that there is a little bit more fluidity and potential for one to make themselves into something else whereas you go back hundreds of years feudal society the farmer what had a farmer's child had a farmer's child there was no chance really for advancement or mobility within a class structure whereas of course in what we have now there's a lot of problems with it but you could argue that there's more mobility and that the value system does does i would say favor an independent self-motivated, autonomous style of existing. So in losing oneself in other ways, I do think we find ourselves in others in this type of society. Uh, of course, there are the shorter attention spans I spoke to, but I also think that the idea of being able to do a lot or finding ways to make magic and spirituality a lot more convenient and casual can be really helpful. That's something that wasn't necessarily so much the case years prior there was a big or heavier aspect of a lot of time needed a lot of focus a lot of serious engaged work whereas today one can find really creative and inventive ways to make spirituality make belief systems make a magical practice work in a faster way in a more casual way in a more comfortable way where we aren't necessarily uh, depleting our reserves or needing to bend over backwards to have a magical practice or to uh, engage in any given practice. So there's that. And I've found so many interesting and creative ways of making things a little bit more convenient. And, and I think that there is a positive way and aspect to that as well. Uh, the sharing of things and that network I spoke about. There are many positives. Of course, we have the information at our disposal. So of course, this is a very modern idea or modern thing that one can seek out all of this information that they previously maybe would not have been able to find. So we can inform ourselves. We can see many different sides of any given opinion, although it seems many of us don't actually do that, but uh, myself included. So, but yes, going out there and really trying to delve into any given topic, to cross research, to check, to fact check. Of course, with so much information, there's a lot to sift through, so there may be a lot of inf misinformation. There's, of course, it's more of a free market system, so anybody can put anything out there. And so we do need to have a good head on our shoulders to question, to think critically. But ultimately, we do have all of this information at our disposal. Should we choose to be active participants, sift through it and figure out what's right or wrong for us, what is true and what's false objectively and subjectively, we have those options. It's really just about pushing ourselves to seek them out, to engage with them. And of course, that's something that in a very convenient society, is a little bit counterintuitive where we have become a bit lazier, our attention spans are shorter, but we do have those. And I think that the information at our disposal is a resounding positive aspect. Again, there's the network of the people. Um, so that again is a resoundingly positive aspect where we may, of course, hundreds of years prior, generations prior, you don't have access, for example, to speak to others in other countries to get perspectives from those from cultures and societies that are not your own 
you can speak to and find people, for example, that have the same interests, that face the same struggles. You can commiserate, you can celebrate each other, you can find community when you, in your physical world, can't. And of course, there are so many positives to that as well. So that's one area and one thing that I think is really great about, you know, modern trends, technology, and the way that, I guess, modernity is having an effect on magical and spiritual practices at large. You can have that solitary practice while still having a community online, which I know many of us here do. And if you're watching this, there's a good chance you're, you're probably a part of that along with me. So there's that. Um, in the materialistic aspect, we do have access to many innovative and interesting tools that I would say generations past didn't. And then when we choose to get creative and use these things in new and interesting ways that can benefit ourselves and our practices, that's when we start to see that idea of aesthetics and materiality actually take on more of a positive tone where there's a lot that can come of it if we are mindful about our consumption and our usage of any of these things. For example, of course, you go back generations, they don't necessarily have all these things at their disposal, things that they may have benefited from, things that may have enhanced their practice or interactions or belief systems immensely that we, for example, take for granted and can seek out very readily. What else do we have? Um, I think that that for the better part, oh, of course, there's the idea of sharing. And I spoke to the negative in that, you know, there's comparison, what is real, trying to understand the, the reality of things, the consensus reality, the objective reality. But there's also the inspiration that can be drawn from the idea that we can, like that network of people, actually have others who want to engage with us in our practices, who can learn from us, where we can share something for the betterment of others, as I hope this very rambly video in some way can benefit somebody out there, even if it's just to make them think about this for however long this video ends up being, which is now seeming to be a bit long. But yeah, there's that as well. And I don't want to go on too long with this. I may make very separate videos that are a lot more detailed on any of these topics, but it was something I was feeling compelled to speak about. So I hope that that was helpful for somebody out there. Feel free to make a response in regards to the effects of modernity on magic and spirituality. I'd be very curious or link videos that you have or may know of that speak to these things. I've watched a bunch. I hope you are all well. Like and subscribe if this was fun or interesting. And until next time, bye.